start out a little bit differently this morning. I want you to take your Bible. Hopefully everyone has a copy of a Bible in their hand. I should have maybe thought this through. Maybe I think we do have some extras downstairs if anyone's desperate, or maybe you can share with someone next to you. I do want you to turn to 2 Timothy. We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to have some slides up as well as we're going through these different passages. That way I don't have to repeat the reference over and over again. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 16. This is a verse that Bible college students get sick of by the time they graduate because it seems like every Bible class, every year, always starts out by looking at this verse. I encourage you guys, everyone, to open it up. It's towards the end of your Bible, right after 1 Timothy, but before Revelation. Read along with me as I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is what it has to say. It says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do you guys believe that? Amen. You know what? I actually don't think you believe it. <laughs> And actually, as I reflect on my own life, I think I tend to not believe it. Actually, I think most Christians, many churches, pastors right now, going through their sermon series, reflect that they do not actually believe this. That all scripture is God-breathed. You know, if we were to change that and say, um, all of the New Testament is God-breathed, Maybe we would agree with that because the Old Testament, that's just outdated. That's thousands of years ago. That doesn't apply anymore. That's, that, 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 that's no longer relevant. Um, maybe that's what we tend to actually believe as Christians. Or, or maybe we'll say things like, all scripture is God-breathed except for the parts where God is really judgmental. And those parts, well, no, that doesn't really matter because, well, there's context. People love that word, context. Uh, you got to look at it in its context, and that doesn't actually mean that God judges us today. So don't worry about all those judgmental passages in the Bible. Um, or, or, or maybe we'll say things like, all scripture is God-breathed except for the really long, boring genealogies. Or the really long lists of how many chariots there were or, or how many men existed in battle. And, and maybe you're like me, I'll, I'll admit this to you, where you're going through some kind of reading plan in your Bible and, and you get to one of those really long passages where you can just see that it's going to be a doozy. And you're looking at your watch, you got to get ready to go to work in a few minutes. And what do you do? Uh, and there was a hundred chariots and uh, okay, one more. All right, next chapter. We look at a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and it says that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, but we as Christians don't actually tend to live in a way that reflects that. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and I want to maybe look at a few of those reasons. So we're going to be digging around a lot in our Bible this morning. Turn with me to another passage. Turn with me to 2 Kings. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 2. I think we'll have a slide up there as well. There we go. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. 2 Kings is in your Old Testament. Right after the Samuels. It's before getting to the Psalms. And maybe just to make a point, since we're kind of doing things a little bit different today, is there someone really, really brave this morning who would like to read chapter 2, verse 23? And we'll go through 23 and 24. Would, would anyone like to really be brave this morning and, and just read it out? Don't worry, I'm not going to turn the tables on you and show everyone how big of a sinner you are or, or how stupid you are. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to trick you. And, and, and any brave souls this morning? All right, Travis, thank you. Second Kings chapter 2, 23 and 24. 
that verse is useful for teaching. Yet I don't, I don't think I can remember the last time that a pastor came up at a really cool church with a really cool PowerPoint presentation and said, okay, today we're going to learn about these bears who came and attacked these kids because they made fun of someone who was bold. It's hard to come up with three points and a poem for a passage like that, but that passage is breathed out by God and useful for teaching. But sometimes we ignore that or we don't preach on that or we just skip it over because we say, well, that's something that happened in history that doesn't apply to me today and I'm just going to ignore that or not take it seriously. Or maybe even we say, well, this is too hard for me. I, I, I can't understand this. This is beyond my pay grade. So I'll just tune into the radio and listen to some really smart guy from some Bible seminary somewhere explain it to me. Or I'll just show up to church or I'll call my pastor and he can explain this verse. And we'll get all of our Bible teaching, not actually from the Bible, but from schmucks like me who will just come on Sunday or who will go on the radio, or will have little YouTube, shouldn't say YouTube right now, That's a, won't say YouTube, but who will put things on maybe Facebook or put little things out. Uh, it's not all bad, don't worry, Dr. McMath. <laughs> there is a point to all this. Well, we'll look at maybe one more. Uh, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse nine through 12. The, because you guys see that's in Deuteronomy, you already know where this one's probably headed. Many of you have probably skipped over verses like this many times in a December or a, a January or a February or whenever it is that you're in this part in your reading plan. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in your Bible. It's very near the beginning. Chapter 22, verse 9. Do we have another brave soul who would like to Read oh, up here, Charlene. Okay, you're going to have to do it nice and loud. This is Deuteronomy 22. And why don't you read 9 all the way to 12 if you could do that, Charlene. Do not plant two kinds of seed in your vineyard. If you do, not only the crops you plant, but also the fruit of the vineyard will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Make tassels on the four corners of the cloak you wear. Okay. That verse is breathed out by God and useful for teaching. Not just useful for the people thousands of years ago in the desert who were given that command, but it's actually useful for teaching for you today. But when we get to a verse like that, we say, well, somehow this must not apply to me anymore. I, I, I am not the one that fits in this. Obviously, I'm not going to follow all these ridiculous rules. Uh, this is not the book for me. Let, let me turn to maybe one of the Gospels where, or maybe one of the Psalms where I can get something that, 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 that really encourages me. So that's another reason maybe why we don't read all of God's breathed out scripture. Not just because we think maybe it's confusing, but also because we think it just doesn't apply to us anymore. Let's look at one more before we move on. We're going to go to Mark. This will be the last one in our little experiment. Mark chapter 14. Near the end of Mark chapter 14, verse 51 to 52. Do we have a brave soul? This will be the final time I ask. He would like to read verses 51 and 52 in the Gospel of Mark chapter 14. Do. Who do we have over here? Vaughn, thank you. Nice and loud, Vaughn. Mark 14, 51 and 52. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Okay. And then maybe one of the reasons why we don't think that all scripture applies to us is because sometimes, like me trying to put together a piece of furniture from Ikea, we just think that there's extra parts in the Bible that, that, that maybe are just there by mistake, that, that the Bible is full of really, really good teaching, but sometimes maybe things just fall through the cracks. So sometimes there's just filler verses that, that are just kind of providing uh, the means to the good stuff that you want to put on posters and that you want to put on calendars and stuff that you can buy at the Christian bookstore. That verse that Vaughn just read is also God breathed and useful for teaching. 
in an equal way to John 3.16 or Genesis 1.1. The point in all of this that we need to get across and the point that will be the purpose of this morning's series and sermon in Genesis is that God's word matters. All of God's word matters. And when God gives people his word, his expectation is that they will receive it and that they will respond to it. And there is no better example of that than of the men that we call the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. So turn with me to Genesis. We are going to be at the end of chapter 35, spilling into 36. But because we're already just going crazy this morning, before we get to Genesis 35, actually turn with me to Genesis 15. We're going to do a little bit of a rewind. We've already preached through this. We're, 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 we're double dipping. But as we look at these patriarchs and as we look at the end of chapter 35, we're going to recognize that in this story of Genesis, this story of a broken family that God is going to use to fix the world, we are coming at the end of chapter 35 and into 36 into a major period of transition. These verses that we're later going to look at, uh, they're not just filler verses. They're not just extra things that were added for people who cared more than we do. Uh, They're not things that uh, are no longer relevant to us today. What we're going to be looking at at this passage this morning is a crucial set of verses to understanding the larger story of what God is doing to the patriarchs. And to really hammer home that point, we need to rewind a little bit and look at Genesis 15. I remember these verses well because I had to preach these verses on my kitchen counter because I had a cough in a time in human history where having a cough was a really bad thing to have. (laughs) So I had to preach it in front of the computer on a Sunday morning at my kitchen counter, but... Despite the technology, it was God's words that had power, wasn't it? Regardless of whether or not I was there. And look at the words, the words that God is going to breathe out to Abraham in chapter 15, and we'll look at verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, came to Abraham. He says, this man referring to a servant of Abraham, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And God brought Abram outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then God said to Abram, so shall your offspring be. God breathed out a set of very important words to Abram. And the amazing thing about the words that God had to say is that God's words seem to be in direct contradiction to the tangible, physical evidence that was surrounding Abraham. Abraham could look at himself and see that he was old. Abraham could look at his wife and not say it, of course, but see that his wife was old. He saw the evidence around him. He saw that they were unable to have children. But instead of trusting in the evidence that he could see around him, he chose instead to trust in the word that God had given him. And guess what happened as a result? Read the next verse. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Not because Abraham packed up his bags and moved to a different part of the Middle East. That's not what counted to him as righteousness. Not because Abraham did some impressive sacrifice or was really nice to Lot and allowing them to choose the land to pasture in. Or not because he gave all this money to a king named Melchizedek. None of those things were counted to Abraham as righteousness. But receiving and believing in the word of the Lord despite the evidence around him, that is what made Abraham righteous. Okay, now turn with me to Genesis 35. Because what we're going to see at the end of chapter 35 is we are going to see that God's breathed out words can be trusted 
and that his words are true and that God's words do matter. And we're going to see that as we get ready to bury and say goodbye to that son that was promised in chapter 15, that son named Isaac. Read with me in verse 27 of Genesis 35. Thanks for sticking with me as we're jumping all over the place today. It says in verse 27 that Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned or traveled or lived as immigrants. And in verse 28 says that the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and was gathered to his people old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. You see, if you are just flipping through your Bible when you do your Bible reading and you show up to a verse like that, it doesn't really to seem, it doesn't seem to have very much power to it. When you are going through some kind of random Bible study and they tell you that your assigned verses for this day are Genesis chapter 35, 27 to 29, you read it and your eyes are just going to want to glaze over because like watching one scene out of a movie, you are trying to see God's words isolated from the rest of the words that come before and come afterwards. This is more than just an old man named Isaac who is dying with these long lists happening before and after. This is proof of the fact that when God told Abraham that he was going to have a son and that his son was going to have sons who were going to indwell the land that God had promised, it meant that God was going to do it. That God was going to keep his promises. And if you want to get really crazy, you could look at when Abraham died and compare the verses that talk about Abraham dying to the verses talking about Isaac dying. You would find that they are almost identical. That Abraham lived to 175 years old. He lived a long and fruitful life. He was sojourning. He was living as an immigrant in this land that God had promised. And guess what? Abraham died, but God's promise didn't. Because Isaac is going to end up having the same fate. Isaac is going to live in the land. He's never going to leave it. He's going to stay in the land that God has promised. And he's going to live to a long and fruitful life of 180 years. And he is going to die. But God's promise hasn't. Because just as when Abraham died, who were the two people that came together to bury him? Isaac and Ishmael, two broken brothers, two peoples, two nations who were at odds with each other, who are now coming together to bury their father Abraham. Look at what's happening here at this chapter. The same exact thing. Two nations who have been warring with one another and who will someday war with each other again throughout the Old Testament, they are now coming together to bury their father Isaac. Isaac is now dead, but God's promise isn't. And what's so amazing looking at these actual verses in your page is that it's almost this illustration of what's happening where we see these two sons both coming from different directions, both coming from different mindsets, different viewpoints, and they're coming together to bury their father Isaac. And you look in the text and what is taking place on both sides of the text of Isaac's burial in the passage here. On one side, you have a genealogy for Isaac, or uh, Jacob, and on the other side, in chapter 36, what do you have? A genealogy for Esau. So just as as these two brothers are coming together to bury their father, it's almost like Moses, who wrote this, is kind of doing the same thing in how he's communicating God's words. Because right before Isaac is buried, look at what we have starting uh, in verse 20. Three, second half of 22 and verse 23, we see a list of Jacob's sons. You see, when God gave his word to Abraham, Abraham had zero sons. But now he has had Isaac, but not just Isaac. He's had Isaac, 
and Jacob and Esau. And look at all of these sons who are going to come from Jacob. Look at these 12 sons. Look at these stars that God is putting in the sky. Look at Reuben. Look at Simeon. Look at Levi. Look at Judah. Look at Issachar. Look at Zebulon. Look at the two little boys from Rachel in verse 24. Look at Joseph and Benjamin, the son of Jacob's right hand. Look at these sons of a bond servant, these, these sons of a concubine, Bilia in verse 25. Look, look at Dan and Naphtali. Look at the sons of this other concubine, Zilba, Zilpa, uh, Leah's servant. Look at Gad and Asher. Look at the children that God has promised and provided to Abraham. Abraham died, but God's promise didn't. Isaac is now dead, but God's promise isn't. God is keeping his word that he breathed out to the patriarchs. And a chapter like 35 and 36 really proves that. Whenever you come in your Bible reading to the really boring parts like this, especially in the Old Testament, where there are long genealogies, especially in Genesis, but I think as a rule of thumb in many parts of the Bible, in your mind, you need to be thinking transition. The Bible is trying to get the reader, it's trying to get the audience to understand that a transition is taking place. One of the most beautiful examples of that is actually in the verses leading up to our first sermon in this series at the end of Genesis chapter 11. When we learned about the flood and we learned about the Tower of Babel and we learned about God creating the heavens and the earth, but then at the end of chapter 11, you will find a genealogy. So-and-so had so-and-so who had so-and-so and who had so-and-so who had a man named Abram. The Bible, the Old Testament, likes to make transitions through genealogies. So when you come across those in your reading, don't just see it as filler. Don't just see it as something extra or something written for a different group of people that no longer applies to you. But look at it as a continuation and an affirmation of the fact that God is still keeping his promises. Any time in the Bible when you see a genealogy of people who begat so-and-so and so-and-so, more often than not, is it is a reminder of the promise that God made in Genesis 15. Look at the stars that God is continuing to put in the sky. Look at the children that are continuing to be born to the sons of Abraham and to the sons of Jacob. That's how we need to understand this. I'm not going to preach verse by verse through chapter 36. I want you guys to still employ me as your pastor. <laughs> but you can look at chapter 36, and you can see all these names that to you, you don't know these people, but God knows them. They're not alive anymore, but God's promise is still alive through the birth of these people. God has at this point created two nations. Just like there was two nations warring in Rebecca's womb, there are now two nations existing on this planet. I think we can go to another slide that shows that. There we go. We see these sons of Jacob. We see these sons of Esau. Chapter 36 doesn't just give us the sons, but it gives us the grandsons. It goes through multiple generations. There's people who think that chapter 36 is just some fragment found hundreds and hundreds of years later in, in some place that they decide to just insert into Genesis, that, that chapter 36 is almost an accident. It doesn't belong in Genesis, not by God's mindset. Chapter 36 is God-breathed because it is showing that God's promises are true. Not only are descendants being born from Abraham, not only are nations being born from Abraham, but also from Rebecca, we now see that there are two nations that have come from these two twins that were in her belly. That's why chapter 36 matters. So the point now is that we are transitioning to kind of our third act of the book of Genesis. We looked at Abraham and Isaac. We saw their ups and downs of faithfulness. We saw this beautiful journey of faith 
that Jacob went through as he traveled up to Padan Aram and then he traveled back down into the promised land. We saw that journey of faith. Now in this third act, the focus is going to be on this new young nation of Israel. This national identity. These 12 sons. What is God going to make of these 12 sons? How is God going to use them? A king was promised last week. Where is the king going to come from? Which son is going to be the one through whom these kings come? That is going to be the focus of our third act in Genesis. What is God going to do with these 12 sons? What is God going to do with this nation of Israel? And who is the seed? Who is the next seed? We knew it was Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. Who is the fourth guy? And we will end on that because there is one set of verses that we have still not looked at, but that are still God-breathed. Verse 22, chapter 35. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and laid with Bilya his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. You guys will remember that at this point, Rachel is dead. She's given birth to this son named Ben, son of sorrow, that Jacob is going to turn to son of my right hand. I think a good reason for that is because in Jacob's mind, Benjamin very well could be that son. He could be that seed. He could be that son of promise. It is clear that Benjamin is a favored child in Jacob's heart. This baby that came from his beloved woman, Rachel, who is now dead. And look at what Reuben does. Not only does he disgrace his father, Reuben is a son of Leah, remember. Not only does he embarrass and disgrace his father, but just like Absalom did to his father David's concubines, Reuben is almost making a power play, saying, hey, the guy who does you know what to the dad's women is the guy who gets to be the dad someday is the guy who gets to be the one in charge someday because he's the one that is having relations with his father's women. This is more than just Reuben acting inappropriately, although it is. This is more than Reuben just wanting to get his kicks. This is Reuben making a play or a claim to being that seed, to being that child of the promise. But God is going to have bigger plans. We've seen what's happened to Simeon. We've seen what's happened to Levi, these men who slaughtered this entire town. We've now seen what's happened to Reuben. The question is, who is going to be the seed? The rest of Genesis is going to tell us. I'm looking forward to checking out God's word. Pray with me.